my dear children hope you are safe and sound at home and in my literature lesson today i'm going to talk about another poem in your syllabus that is the eagle by alfred lord tennyson alfred lord tennyson is a poet belonging to the victorian era and he was the poet laureate during much of queen victoria's time and he has written many poems both short poems and blank verse and the charge of the lie brigade break 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 and tears idle tears are some of his short poems and idols of the king and ulysses are some of his blank verse most memorable blank verse and the most remarkable poem that he wrote was in memoriam ahh which was written in the memory of his friend arthur hallam and as the source material for his poetry he used a wide range of subject matter ranging from medieval legends to classical myths and from domestic situations to uh, observations of nature and he's most ardently remembered for his mastery of rhythm and the richness of imagery in his poems now let's look at the poem which is prescribed in your anthology that is the eagle by tennyson before going into the poem let me ask you some questions what kind of a bird is an eagle have you seen eagles do you see them every day everywhere what qualities can you attribute to eagles what are the qualities associated with eagles eagles are very powerful and large birds of prey and they have large hooked beaks and powerful talons with which they can catch their prey and they have excellent eyesight and usually they build their nests on tops of tall mountains or in tall trees and there are different qualities associated with them in different fields qualities like power leadership vision bravery endurance and courage and so on right now we know a little bit about eagles in general now let's see whether this particular eagle in this poem has the same qualities that we mentioned earlier shall we read the poem first he clasps the crag with crooked hands close to the sun in lonely lands ringed with the azure world he stands the wrinkled sea beneath him crows he watches from his mountain walls and like a thunderbolt he falls quite a short and simple poem isn't it it's composed of only two stanzas with three lines each but it's full of figurative language and meaning now let's look at the incident in the poem what is the poem about as the title itself suggests the poem is about one eagle alone in the wild and in the first line he is on a top of a tall mountain cliff poised to strike he is in a place where no other human or animal can reach he is alone in his grandeur alone in his splendor with the sun and the bright blue sky forming a perfect background for his posture on the mountain cliff the second stanza talks about the eagle's action in the the first and the second lines of the second stanza shows when as the eagle watches from his high perch the sea moves below him and in the final line the bird makes a grand dive towards the sea probably to catch his prey so that's it that is basically the story or the incident in the poem and now let's go through the poem uh, line by line and find out what it is really about let's look at the first line again shall we read the first line again he clasps the crag with crooked hands he clasps the crag with crooked hands poem begins with a description of a creature labeled him with the pronoun he so who is this he in the poem if you read the title it's clear isn't it the poet is describing an eagle an eagle who is on a top of a crag which means a rocky cliff the eagle is clasping the crag clasping is uh, to hold on to or to clutch the rock so he is holding on to the rock with his crooked hands what is crooked means crooked means twisted or misshapen right so here is an eagle holding on to a rocky cliff with his twisted or crooked hands now let's go a little bit deeper into the line and see what it really means tennyson refers to the bird as he here do we usually refer to birds as he what is the pronoun we use to refer to birds or animals it isn't it and this particular bird also has hands crooked hands do birds have hands children they have talons or claws not hands but the poet 
has attributed or imbued the bird with human-like qualities. He has personified the bird. The word, the pronoun he is used to describe the word and this particular bird has hands, crooked hands. Do birds have hands? No, they have talons or claws. So what has Tennyson done here? He has imbued uh, the bird with human-like features, human qualities. What is the technique used here? We call it personification. Personification is when an animal or an inanimate object is attributed with human qualities. So the bird is personified. The poet is talking about it as a human. Why is he doing that? Why has he personified the bird? What's the purpose of using this technique here? Here, the poet is trying to show his admiration towards the eagle. This is not just an ordinary eagle, but it's an exceptional creature. So is it only the admiration that he's trying to show here? No, the bird symbolizes power, the eagle symbolizes power, and it's referred to as he. So the poet is trying to say that the eagle symbolizes not just humans, but humans who have power, powerful people. The eagle is clasping the crack with crooked hands. Crooked may mean physically twisted, but it also may mean uh, dishonest or corrupted. So this person that the poet is referring to is, although he has power, he's corrupted, he's dishonest, and he's clasping to this crag very tightly. That is, he is clasping to his power or he is uh, holding on to his power tightly, fearing that he might lose it. Here, there is another technique used by the poet, that is alliteration, uh, the repetition of cur sound in clasps, crag, and crooked. And it helps to heighten the harshness, the uh, roughness, the coarseness of the bird, and while increasing the rhythm of the phrase. Let's look at the second line now. Close to the sun in lonely lands. Close to the sun in lonely lands. Where is the bird? He's close to the sun. His mountain cliff is close to the sun. So is the bird actually close to the sun? No, it's physically impossible to be close to the sun, isn't it? The sun is millions of miles away from earth. So the bird is not actually close to the sun, but the poet wants to emphasize the inaccessibility of the bird and the power of the bird. The bird is so powerful that he could even go near the sun. The eagle is above everyone else. Here, it's not only the inaccessibility, the poet is also trying to say that the bird is alienated, the bird is detached from the rest of the world, the bird is aloof. The technique here is hyperbole, that is the extreme exaggeration or magnification of something. So the poet has used this technique uh, to emphasize the power of the bird and its inaccessibility. Let's look at the second part of the line, lonely lands. What does that imply? Lonely means there's no one else there. We know this is to be true because eagles are usually seen, uh, not seen in flocks, but they are seen alone in solitude. They like to be alone. Here, either the bird loves to be alone or that loneliness is imposed upon him by his nature, the power he has. If we talk about the implication of this line, it talks about nature of powerful people, the way they keep their distance from others, the way they try to be detached from others, distance themselves from others, and they either love to be alone or that loneliness is imposed upon them because of their power, because of the nature of their surroundings, the power they have. The phrase lonely lands also suggests that the eagle is dominating the sky. He's the ruler of the sky. He's the only person who can reach up to the sun and he's the, the most dominant figure around. So what qualities of a powerful person are brought out here? Detachment, alienation, aloofness, and uh, the distance that they keep from others. So here, the eagle is symbolic of powerful people or people in power. The prominent assonance of O sound in close and lonely helps to highlight the sense of loneliness and distance and the alliteration of L sound in lonely lands contributes to the musical quality of the line. Now let's look at the third line. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. Azure world refers to the sky of 
the color blue and the bird is circled or ringed with the blue sky. It creates a marvelous picture, a wonderful picture of the bird standing on the top of a mountain with the blazing sun behind him and the bright blue sky around him. Can you see this image in your mind? It's very powerful visual imagery, isn't it? This description creates a wonderful picture of a monarch on his throne. The passive action stands, rhymes with hands and lands in the previous lines and helps to highlight the stillness or inertness uh, of the bird and the cesura or the kama before the word he also contributes to this stillness. So when you take the first stanza as a whole, the bird is described vividly. Uh, it shows poet's admiration towards the bird. The poet is celebrating nature, admiring nature, but at the same time, using the eagle symbolically, he's trying to give us a message. He's trying to uh, create a picture of a very powerful person or people who are in power and bring out or highlight their nature, the qualities that they get when they are in power. Now let's move on to the second stanza. Now let's move on to the second stanza. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. The wrinkled sea. What does that mean? Wrinkled means that you are marked with many lines similar to the skin of an elderly person. So why is the poet using the word wrinkled to refer to the uh, waves of the sea? Usually the waves of the sea are big or sometimes huge, but the poet has used the word wrinkled to refer to the rolling waves of the sea. It's because of the extreme height from which the bird is looking at the sea. Because of the extreme height, the bird sees the waves of the sea as wrinkled. They are reduced to wrinkles. The big waves are reduced to wrinkles. That is one thing. There's another thing. The poet also wants to emphasize that the huge sea, the vast sea, the powerful sea is not that powerful when compared to the eagle. So he has demeaned the the power of the sea in front of this powerful, this supreme eagle. And the poet also says that the sea is beneath the eagle. The word beneath also emphasizes that the sea is weak compared to the eagle. Eagle is more powerful than the sea. Next, the action performed by the sea is quite unusual. The sea crawls. What does that mean? The word crawls emphasizes that sea is weak, it's like a baby or a reptile and it shows you that the sea is vulnerable, isn't it? It's less powerful compared to the eagle here. The lexical choice or the word use of Tennyson, the birds like wrinkled beneath and crows helps or contributes to highlight the vulnerability of the sea when compared to the eagle. And the wrinkled sea may also refer to the ordinary people or the subjects of the eagle who are submissive, who become very humbled in the presence of this powerful eagle or this powerful ruler or this powerful monarch. And here the crawling sea is actually a metaphor, isn't it? Right, let's move on to the next line. He watches from his mountain walls. He watches from his mountain walls. The dwelling of the bird is this mountain cliff. It's his mountain walls. The entire mountain belongs to the bird. That's why the poet has used the possessive pronoun his. And it also creates a picture of a fortress, a citadel. So this is the citadel of this monarch, the eagle. So what is the bird doing here? He's, he watches. Here we see personification again. And what is the bird doing here? He watches from his mountain walls. Look at the word choice of Tennyson here. Careful selection of bird watchers. It denotes that the bird, it adds intention and consciousness of a, an alert or a watchful human 
to the bird. The bird is not just watching randomly or aimlessly, but it's watching focusedly. So the eagle is not watching aimlessly or randomly, but it's focused and resourceful. The metaphorical phrase mountain walls implies of a home. The mountain walls are the home of the eagle. And it also creates a picture of a citadel, a fortress of a king, isn't it? This bird is the king to this mountainous kingdom. He is the king of the sea, he is the king of the sky, and now he is the king of this mountainous kingdom. So, what is the nuance in this line? If we are talking about a powerful person, they usually have their own strongholds to protect them from danger and it also means that the person is inaccessible no one can reach him no one is allowed to reach him and then the final line and like a thunderbolt he falls and like a thunderbolt he falls so in the final line uh, the bird makes a grand dive towards the sea probably to catch its prey like a thunderbolt what is a thunderbolt? A thunderbolt is a powerful, beautiful natural force, but at the same time, it's destructive, isn't it? The thunderbolt suggests the swiftness, the suddenness of the bird's downward flight, but it also brings out the destructive nature of the bird. So here, although the poet is magnificent, although the bird is powerful, it's dangerous, it's destructive, isn't it? And when it comes down like a thunderbolt, do you think the prey or the victims of this bird would stand a chance? If we associate this quality with the humans, it shows that the powerful, their descent on their victims or ordinary people is always well-timed and focused and quite unexpected. And this fall also may suggest fall from power. People who are in power will not remain there permanently. Power is not permanent. They might fall at any time, in an instant. So Tennyson here tries to bring out the impermanent or the transient nature of power. So here he is bringing out a universal truth about nature of power, isn't it? And when it comes to the techniques in this line, like a thunderbolt is a simile which is used to describe or to emphasize the suddenness or, or the swiftness of the bird's downward flight. Right, now we have come to the end of the poem. Taken as a whole, the poem describes vividly this magnificent bird and its life. And at the same time, he is bringing out a truth about nature of power and nature of powerful people. So it's not just a mere description of a bird, but it brings out a universal truth as well. Now let's look at the structure of the poem and the techniques. This is a two stanza poem that is separated out into two sets of three lines known as tersets. These tersets follow a very simple rhyme scheme that conforms to a pattern of rhyming triplets, AAA, and BBB. The poet has employed an array of techniques to express his ideas in the poem. What are they? Personification, alteration, hyperbole, assonance, metaphors, simile, and visual imagery. And the rhythm throughout the poem is brought out with the use of iambic tetrameter, that is four feet in each line, creating a wonderful rhythm. So, Although a very simple poem, the poem is full of figurative language and deep meaning. And I have included two essay type questions that you can practice for your exam. Uh, try to answer these children from what you learned today and develop an answer. Hope you enjoyed and learned something about the poem today. And until we meet again, all the best and goodbye.